because the story of Youngstown has turned out to be the story of America. And um, I just want to talk a, a little bit about my day to day. Um, Scott Paul, we were in with a class of students, uh, maybe a couple of classes of students. There were about 50 students there. Scott asked them if everybody who had a family member who worked in manufacturing to raise their hands. And the, the majority of people in the room raised their hands. Uh, he then asked them if uh, they would raise their hands if they knew somebody uh, who had been laid off in a from a manufacturing job. And about the same number of hands went up. Then he asked them, how many of you would want to work in a manufacturing plant? And of 50 students, maybe two or three raised their hands. Then he asked them, how many of you would recommend to your child at some point when you have children to work in a manufacturing plant? And not a hand went up. That's our future. That, for me, just to see that, um, that, that is just it's devastating. Um, we have our work cut out for us. Good old president last night said, the worst of the storm has passed. And I just hope to God he's right. But I have a sense that he's not. I just have a sense that he's not. And um, because I pay attention to this, this is my life. I go to bed at night, I cover manufacturing, I'll go to bed at night thinking about all the things that I've learned that day and all the people I talk to. And I'm a journalist, so I try to stay on the cutting edge of what's happening. So I, I'm not afraid of numbers. I'm not afraid of people getting uh, kind of like passionate um, or being deliberative or like analytical or um, thoughtful. Um, so I thought I'd start by giving you a couple of anecdotes, a couple of stories, uh, because maybe because I'm Irish and because I'm a writer, maybe I write them better than I can speak them. But um, so 2000. Six. I was asked to speak at the SouthCon show. It's the IEEE, the International Economics, no, International Electronics and Electrical um, Institute. Uh, it's, it's all the people who are involved in the electronics industry. And this was held in Orlando, Florida. And I went to the show, and I was speaking with one of the chapter authors in the book here that we did with Ron Hira. And there were 15 or 20 people in the audience. And this was, uh, I, I asked the, the show sponsor, I said, what, what's happening? What, you know, this is the big IEEE show in the Southeast. The Southeast was a really big uh, center for electronics manufacturing for decades. And he said, we've lost our electronics industry. He says, it's gone. This show, seven to 10 years ago, had 10,000 people, and now we have about 200 to 300 people. He said, we've lost the industry, it's gone. So I said, wow. Um, the terror. So that was in 2006. Two years later, in November 2008, I was asked to speak at the Defense Manufacturing Conference in Orlando, the same town. And I flew in, and I was sharing a cab with Frank Anderson, who's the uh, president of the Defense Acquisition University. And we're talking in the cab. And uh, so the cab driver's listening to our conversation about kind of the loss of manufacturing and what that means for the defense industrial complex. And, the cab driver pipes up, and he says that the real estate market has collapsed. And he said, we have all these developments here that are empty. He says, my wife uh, is a real estate agent. And what's happened is um, people have had their houses done into foreclosure. And they owe more than they can afford, the house, more than the house is worth. And when they leave the house, they steal the air conditioning unit. And he said, in Florida, you have to have an air conditioning unit going at all times, because otherwise the mold just builds up and we've got a ruined house. He says, so we have all these housing products, <coughs> literally thousands of houses, he says, that are ruined. So, you know, you come to a, a city like this, and you, you know all about that. 
this, is, this has been part of your life here. And you, you look, I, I did this Google tour of uh, Detroit. A friend of mine who works for the Alco Electronics Development Association uh, said, I grew up in Detroit. You gotta go do the Google tour of Detroit. So you go to Google Maps and you, you can buzz around Detroit. You can get about eight, you know, go 800 feet above the city. Then you go, don't go down onto the street. You, you click on the little Google man that's above the zoom tool and you can go on the street. And then you can do these 360 degree turns, so you can get a, get a sense of the city. You do a virtual tour of the city. If you press off in the distance, you can double click and you go down the street 15 or 20 miles an hour. And he said, you gotta check out Detroit. So I did this. And um, I spent hours doing it. I mean, I, I know Detroit, it's amazing. And um, so I called him up, I said, gee, thanks a lot. It really depressed me. Uh, and he said, he said, did you notice the kind of the furrow, the serpentine furrow tracks that you saw? I said, yeah, I, I, just, I didn't understand what they were. He said, those are bulldozer tracks. Because they're bulldozing the houses, they're bulldozing the city. The city is being bulldozed into oblivion, basically. There are sections in Detroit that are, there, I saw one section of 25 square blocks, and I counted them, 25 square blocks with two structures still standing, and all these serpentine furrow tracks, the, the bulldozer tracks. And it was, I did this right as President Obama was deciding that we needed to send 30,000 more troops to Afghanistan. Now, yeah, say what you want about the need for doing that, but it struck me as, like, what are our priorities? We're trying to build Afghanistan, and our, this is a city. I think every single congressman and every single representative should be required to go to Detroit and drive around and see what has become of our country. Because so many of these guys and women, they're totally out of touch. And as somebody who covers manufacturing and industry, and this the engine of our economy, this is what made us a superpower. It's what's making China a superpower. And we have all these people saying, you know, we need to be just a knowledge economy or service economy, and that, that'll be good enough. That, that'll provide all the wealth that we could ever want. And that argument is so specious, and it's been proven to be so wrong. It's been proven to be absolutely, completely wrong. In the latest issue that I just uh, put out of my publication, um, I did a story on the offshore networking research center that's uh, run by the Duke University. And they, they um, do research on the offshoring of service sector jobs. You know, we've seen manufacturing jobs go. And they just did a study, this is just, you know, the, the latest news story from my publication. They did a study on how all of these countries uh, have tar are targeting our service industries. Um, back office operations, call centers, um, the software, the writing software, um, and the latest, uh, also, research and development and design. And the latest is legal services. Because the legal services industry has been really hit hard by this recession. So now they're outsourcing, the legal services industry is outsourcing their back office work to these uh, outsourcing uh, companies located in China. China is providing incentives for all these companies to get into the outsourcing industry. So they've targeted now they have targeted our service. These are the, these are the jobs that you're going to not need to do when you're when you're done with manufacturing. These are the jobs. And so I'm reading this report and I'm writing about it. And it's you know okay. So it's one thing to lose our manufacturing jobs. It's another thing. Maybe it's good to lose all those legal services jobs. You know we, we're so litigious. Um, but. You know, maybe maybe the legal services industry is going to figure this out now because the, the wave that hit you guys is the wave that's going to hit them. 